stop at the right time. Thanks for joining us on Power Lunch. This is Bloomberg Quint. I'm Harsha Subramanian. Good afternoon. I'm Ira Dugal. Let's get you the headlines this afternoon. Markets trade near session lows. The Nifty dips below the 10,600 mark. The rupee trading at 13-month lows. Bharti Infratel will merge with Indus Towers, creating a $14.5 billion entity that will be the largest telecom tower operator outside of China. Fortis Healthcare gets three new offers, binding offers that is, ahead of the advisory panel's evaluation of bids. IHH and Radiant are put in their offers and Manipal sweetens its. Bankers say Arcelor Mittal's offer for SR Steel proposed lower haircut for lenders in the first round of bidding. Lenders also detect more issues that may lead to Arcelor Mittal, New Metal being deemed ineligible. All right, uh, but first, let's take a look at how the markets are faring. About a tenth of a percent low on the Sensex and Nifty. Neeraj is here with us giving us a check on the markets. Afternoon, Neeraj. Hey, afternoon, guys. So volatility is up. Volumes are up. Penultimate day to expire. You would anyways expect volumes to be up. Volatility after yes, hitting calendar year lows yesterday has moved up in the session today. So India VIX about 4, 4.5% higher. Volumes have picked up in trade today. And the standout movers on the large caps, at least, are the commodity names which have fallen. So the Hindalco's, Vedanta's are down in the session today. And the Bharti twins are doing reasonably OK. Airtel, in particular, doing reasonably OK for itself. But the real action uh, still lies at the broader end of the spectrum. And uh, uh, moves in clutches. So firstly, IT continues to rise and shine. LNT Infotech, a case in point. Emphasis, I think, gained slightly further as well. So technology companies are, are doing rather well for themselves. I think 9% the kind of gains. Yes, Infosys that are true, but the mid-cap end of the uh, uh, technology space has done rather well for itself. And ID Tech is up about 8% as well, and the volumes have picked up into all of these. So that is the first set of names which have done well. Uh, real estate probably preempting some positive moves or news that could come in from the DP plan announcements today are doing well. So Brigade Enterprises um, uh, is, is up and about. Oberon Realty about a percent and a half higher. There is also Ruby Mills, uh, that, that land owner which has done well. Ro Raymond, for example, on that land development plan has done reasonably okay for itself. So good going there. And last but not the least, an interesting move in team lease today. A brokerage note, a block deal, uh, multiple things happening here. But look at team lease. 12% higher at 2765. This is now uh, way higher in terms of valuations compared to its nearest counterpart, that is Quest Corp, but it's finding buyers all right. Niraj, thank you so much for that. But you know, the real story is what's going on uh, with the NCLT and what's happening with Fortis. Fortis Healthcare, uh, the race for control has intensified. Three of the bidders have now revised their offers just hours ahead of the advisory panel's recommendations to the board. Yatin has been tracking the story for us. Uh, how do these new bids stack up against each other? Well, uh, very interesting to see because we have Manipal which has revised the bid for uh, the third time. Uh, we also have other bidders which have sweetened the offer. Uh, let's talk about the Manipal's uh, offer first. Now they have revised uh, the new uh, uh, you know, transaction uh, structure uh, by nearly 5-7% uh, as far as the hospital's asset is concerned. So earlier they were valuing the hospital asset at close to 6,000 crores. Now they have up, uh, upped the uh, bid to 6,322 crores. Uh, they also say that they will be launching a 26% open offer which was not the case earlier. Of course this will happen at a price of not more than 121 rupees per share. And also to ease uh, the liquidity conditions of uh, uh, Fortis Healthcare, uh, they plan to uh, give a credit line of 750 crores in, form, in the form of debt and also propose to buy a 5% equity stake in their subsidiary SRL labs uh, and uh, of course uh, it comes with a rider in which they say that they want a 51% voting right on a differential basis. Uh, coming to Radiant Life, uh, this is a healthcare major backed by private equity player KKR. They say that the binding offer uh, uh, is only for buying out the Mulund Hospital for an enterprise value of uh, 1200 crores. Of course, this will probably make uh, Fortis have a liquidity of nearly 650 crores in terms of the cash that they will receive net of debt. Also, they believe that SRL could be valued anywhere between 43 to 48 rupees per share. Uh, this will be, uh, you know, uh, demerged into a separate entity and the open offer for 26% of the hospital's business will be at a 
price of 126 rupees per share slightly better than what manipal offers for only the hospital business and finally let's talk about ihh they also came out with a binding offer to infuse uh, close to 650 crores into the entire fortis healthcare entity at a price of 160 rupees per share uh, they say after uh, the due diligence is done they will be infusing up to 3350 crores via equity uh, and also uh, they say that uh, uh, to further for this uh, uh, you know uh, 650 crore deal to go through uh, they will need board representation of nearly two members from their side so uh, of course all of these offer come with some riders and some conditions but very interesting to see how actually uh, the board takes up the matter on uh, April 26th, wherein uh, they will be making some bit of decision on the binding offers. Interesting that, yeah, I think we also spoke to Abhay Soy of uh, Chairman of Radiant Life earlier today. He says the rationale behind the new offer is to provide, provide immediate liquidity. Listen in. From media reports and what the board said, uh, in their media outs, that uh, they're only looking at binding bids. And, and uh, you know, the real rationale perhaps for this is that there is a requirement of cash. So what we are suggesting is that why don't you sell one of your 35 assets, create that elbow room, so you'll have 1,200 crores of cash. This particular asset sits on RHT books at an AV of, I think, 680 crores. Net, net, uh, even after paying that off, you will have about five, 650 crores of cash uh, with you, and that should give you enough elbow room uh, to allow people to do uh, bidding over the next three, four, five weeks. Uh, so we're saying, look, why don't you open the, uh, the floor for us as well as other bidders in that case? If, uh, you know, debt is available, perhaps that's a, uh, that's a, a, a better route. If not, then you sell one of the assets which represents maybe 6.5% of the total bed strength that you have, uh, has about a, maybe a 55, 57 crores of EBITDA, has a lease amount to RHT of a similar amount. So effectively, what you're getting is, uh, when you're selling it, we're looking to buy it at a multiple of maybe 20, 21 times. On to the latest in the SR Steel insolvency matter. Bloomberg Quint learns that Arcelor Mittal placed a higher bid for SR Steel in the first round of bidding compared to the competitor, uh, which was New Metal. Vishnath Nair joining us with the details. Vishnath, what have you picked up? Uh, so what we understand uh, from the lenders is that yesterday there was an eight-hour long meeting uh, where the lenders were discussing uh, the bids which were opened uh, from New Metal and Arcelor Mittal the first round. So they found out that, uh, and they also looked at the forensic report which was prepared by Kroll uh, after the resolution professional asked for it. Um, now, in this forensic audit, it's come across that uh, there are some other violations under Section 29A of the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code, which may work against uh, uh, both the bidders, New Metal as well as Arslaw Metal. So, the first issue on the NPA front, now that has been discussed at length at the NCLT, and uh, you know uh, there, there has been a lot of argument on it. But uh, some of the other issues, such as uh, regulatory orders against uh, both bidders or associated companies, uh, there's also criminal prosecutions against. Uh, uh, now, this is what lenders are telling us: we still don't have details as to which criminal specific uh, prosecution they're referring to, but there are cases pending against uh, these companies. Uh, remember, there are more than 2,000 associated companies, uh, both of these bid bidders put together, which have been assessed by uh, Kroll for this forensic audit. So obviously, it's difficult to pinpoint which companies the issues are at at this point in time. But these are some issues that the lenders have seen, and they want to f first discuss and see whether this is worth uh, you know, uh, disqualifying both these bidders for. Because if you remember in Electro Steel, now with Vedanta also had a similar criminal prosecution, so that was also uh, discussed. But but you know, lenders want to see whether whether this is something worth uh, you know disqualifying these bids against uh, uh, bids uh, under Section 29A. The NCLT is also obviously uh, given the bidders a liberty to go ahead and challenge if they feel that the decision is not in their favor. Uh, so this will open another uh, round of debate. Uh, as part of their discussions over the next two days, the lenders will be also discussing whether they want to go to the NCL, uh, whether they want to challenge the NCLT's decision at the NCLAT, uh, the appellate tribunal, and see if they, if they can find a way to uh, to get out of this order, uh, forcing them to look at the first round of bids. So that's what we picked up so far. All right, but uh, uh, I know the eligibility question is more important. But as far as the uh, value that was ascribed to SR Steel based on the first uh, round of bids, uh, what does that work out at? So, for, uh, in case of Arcelor Mittal, the uh, their bid uh, uh, proposes a 30, 35 percent haircut for the lenders. So that's a that's a pretty good valuation for uh, you know uh, for SR Steel as compared with uh, New Metals bid, which uh, values uh, uh, you know which which proposes about a 60, 65 percent haircut. So lenders are debating you know uh, whether.
whether they need to look at the numbers at all because eligibility is question is still pending. Uh, but, but some of the lenders that we spoke to uh, said that uh, so that you know the numbers can never be irrelevant in in such a bidding process. Of course, remember there is a second round of bids also that are pending. So those will also have to be considered or whether they will be considered at all. All of these will be discussed in the next two days. But principally, Asala Mittal was a higher bid. In the first round, yes. Okay. Yeah. Krishna, thank you so much for that. Uh, let's move on now and talk about the other important deal in the telecom tower space. The much anticipated uh, telecom infrastructure space, Bharti Airtel, will merge Indus Towers into Bharti Infratel, creating the largest tower company outside China. Uh, Samit Sarkar is standing by to tell us some of the deal contours. Samit. So if you see Bharti Infratel, which is the listed entity, will offer 1,565 shares to the shareholders of Indus Towers for every one share that they hold currently in Indus Towers. Now, why 1,565 shares? That is because Indus Tower is a much bigger entity and compared to Infratel, the equity base of Indus Towers is very low. So considering the valuation, Infratel will be issuing close to 1,565 shares. Now, if you see the valuations, the deal has been done at par. Now, Bharti Infratel's enterprise value is close to 50 56,000 crore rupees considering yesterday's market capitalization and considering the FY18 EBITDA, the EV2 EBITDA for, and, uh, for Bharat Infidel comes to around 8.7 times. Now, from the share swap ratio that we have been given, that is 1,565 shares for one share of Indastars, Indastars equity value comes to around 61,358 crore rupees. Considering the net debt, the enterprise value of Indastars comes to close to 65,276 crore rupees, which gives us an EV to EBITDA of 8.5 times. That This clearly shows that the valuations has been done at par and the share swap ratio is also at par with the valuations that uh, come in, in front of uh, based on FI18 value. Now, the, now, currently, Indastars is jointly owned by Bharti Infratel, Vodafone, Idea Cellular and Providence, while Bharti Infratel is promoted by Bharti Airtel. But the merged entity will be promoted by Bharti Airtel and Vodafone. So, Idea and Providence have an uh, option to either stake, take stake in the merged entity or to, uh, or to exit from the merged entity. Now, Idea can uh, fully exit from the merged entity and Providence can partially exit from the merged entity. Now, if I, now, there are two scenarios here. Now, if Idea and Providence don't exit from the merged entity, then Bharti Airtel's shareholding in the merged entity will come down to 33.8% from currently 53.5% in Bharti Infratel. And if uh, Idea and Providence exit, then Bharti Airtel's uh, part of uh, stake in Bharti in the merged entity will come down to around 37.2% from current 53.5%. But this will also make the merged entity a net debt company from a net cash company. So if you see uh, Idea Cellular and Providence will have to sell their stake for around 8,500 crore rupees to Bharti Infratel. And this will turn Bharti Infratel into a net debt company. So if they sell their shares, Bharti Infratel will have a net debt of close to 5,602 crore rupees. And if they don't sell their shares, then Bharti Infratel Infratel, that is a merged entity of Bharti Infratel Industries, will have a net cash of close to 2,900 crore rupees. So, this will depend on whether Idea and Providence exit or not. But the chances of Idea exiting uh, Bharti, the merged entity is higher because the agreement that Vodafone India and Idea Cellular have, and that it clearly says that Idea will be selling its 11.15% stake in Industries to uh, repay the debt that they have currently on their books. What kind of synergies are we talking about for Bharti out of this? Uh, so for the merge, I'll t for the merge entity, if you see, Indastars and Bharti uh, Infratel, the merge entity will have more than one lakh sixty-three thousand towers, with close to three lakh sixty-seven thousand tenants on that towers, and the tenancy ratio for the merge entity would be close to two point two five times as of thirty-first March twenty eighteen. Now the combined entity will have a market share of around thirty-five percent when it comes to towers, and when it comes to tenants, the market share would be close to forty-five to forty-eight percent. Now currently, the combined entities. Operations overlap only in four circles. As you can see in this chart, uh, it overlaps only in Haryana, Uttar Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh West, and Uttar Pradesh East, and Rajasthan. So limited overlaps mean limited synergies. However, the merger will complete the tower footprint for the combined entity across India. As you can see in this chart, there, they overlap only in four circles. That is Uttar Pradesh West and Uttar Pradesh East, then in Haryana, and then in Rajasthan. So these are the only four circles where they have overlapping operations. But the merger will complete the tower footprint for both the entities. So, the, uh, the 
limited operational synergies, but complete th this will definitely complete the tower footprint of the merged entity. But in monetary terms, the main benefit will come in from the savings that the company will see because of dividend distribution tax. Now, currently, Indus Towers pays a dividend distribution tax of 500 crore rupees, which it will not pay post merger because it will not declare any dividends, so it does need not to pay any dividend distribution tax. Lastly, the financials of the merged entity. Now, the merged entity's revenue would be close to around 25,000. 100 crore with the margins of close to 43 percent and a net profit of close to 4,300 crore rupees. Now these numbers have been derived based on the FI 18 numbers that we have, but this is a broadly what could be the value or uh, financials of the merged entity post merger. Okay, one last point, uh, Samit, and this is about the Airtel's numbers. There was a tax tax right back which sort of surprised the street. Uh, any other key highlights from the numbers of Airtel? So if you see the headline numbers for Bharati Airtel, they were in line with the analyst estimates. Revenue was down by close to 3% to 19,634 crore rupees, while EBITDA was down to 6,930 and margins contracted to 35.3%. On the bottom line front, the company did report a net profit on the back of a deferred tax credit that they accounted for and the deferred tax credit was close to 464 crore rupees, which, came, uh, which resulted into a net profit for the company of around 83 crore rupees for the fourth quarter of financial year 2018. So if you see in this quarter, also it was the uh, Africa operations that have helped the company uh, to uh, put up good results on the operational side the net profit from the Africa business was close to 699 crore rupees which was at its all-time high and that of India operations which does not only have the wireless business but also the DTH and the enterprise business of Bharti uh, Airtel uh, posted a loss of close to 652 crore rupees and this was the first time that the company has done in the last 15 years now on the EBITDA margin front if you see you can clearly see a divergence here India the EBITDA margins of the India wireless business has come down from 42 percent in the second quarter of financial year 2017 to 28% in the fourth quarter of financial year 2018, while that of Africa business has increased from 23% to 36%, which is also the highest that the company has seen till now. Now, on the data consumption front, which is a key theme in the current market scenario, it has increased for Bharti Airtel, but at a slower rate. Now, uh, data consumption as of fourth quarter was close to 6.6 .6 GB, which has increased only 24.5% compared to the last quarter. On the cap capital expenditure side, which is a key element to sustain the current market scenario, it has remained at an elevated level. For the fourth quarter, the capital expenditure was close to 6,300 crore rupees, and for the, and for the financial year 2018, it was more than 26,000 crore rupees for Bharti Airtel. Lastly, on the leverage side, now Bharti Airtel's net debt to EBITDA stood at its all-time high of 3.23 times, while its net debt was close to 95,000 crore rupees as of 31st March 2018. Now, company will be holding its conference call today, and the key things to watch out for in the conference call would be the company's capex plan for fi19 how they're going to fund it and what will be the leverage ratio of the company going forward along with that an update on the completion of the recent acquisitions that the company has made also the further stake sale in infratel this will be important post the infratel index merger announcement that has come in today also further stake sale in this in the dth arm along with that the street will also be watching out for any management commentary related to outlook on their africa business and also on geo's aggressive tariff plans that we have seen in the recent past so I mean, thank you for uh, putting all of that in context uh, Jaydeep Ghosh, partner of Telecom at KPMG, now joins us from Delhi. Jaydeep, pleasure having you on the show. Uh, what have you made of Indus merging into Bharti in Fratel? Uh, what does this mean for the overall plans for Bharti in particular? So I think this, uh, you know, this approval of the merger and the merger process uh, going through was anticipated for uh, quite some time. Of course, several of the regulatory approvals are, are needs to be taken, and uh, which will take a while, perhaps the, the current financial year. This, uh, to summarize, and I was uh, trying to cope up with the several numbers and statistics which. Uh, our colleague was, you know, uh, speaking about in the last, uh, you know, couple of minutes when I joined uh, uh, you as such. So I think it, it uh, to summarize because numbers have been mentioned. I think it makes ample sense uh, for all these stakeholders, not only Bharti Airtel and uh, Indus Tower and, and Infratel, also for Vodafone Idea and and Providence, uh, both from uh, purely if you look at a, you know financial investment, you know, exit that kind of strategy, as well as from an operational synergy and. Uh, what makes sense for the business uh, given the current situation where the telecom sector overall and the tower sector uh, you know has kind of uh, now reached here from where it was uh, a few years back so it definitely makes ample business sense as well as you know purely if one looks at it from a financial investment it, it makes uh, a lot of sense
specifically on you know the fact that this combined entity will now control one third of the towers in in, in India, 35% uh, market share. The numbers are pretty staggering in that sense, Jaydeep. Uh, do you see this sailing through all regulatory approvals easily? So I think, see, uh, we have a, a similar ratio. And last uh, evening, I was, uh, you know, on on Bloomberg went uh, with you, uh, where the significant market power for the operator was, uh, you know, defined by TRAI as 30% share of the market, either by revenue or by number of subscribers, which of course for now has been kind of. Uh, state by the appellate authority. The 35% in any industry is, is a significant number. However, uh, as we have seen, and just to summarize, the tower, telecom tower industry, you know, when Indus was set up a uh, decade back, it was a pioneering move in the Indian context and probably also in the world context. From there, we've seen many transitions and mostly we have seen in a consolidation uh, into a few hands. So we've seen even Vodafone and idea in the process of very recently, you know, uh, their independent towers uh, being uh, acquired by, or in the process of being acquired by ATC American Tower. And, and we've seen Reliance Communications uh, selling off, I think, 43,000 towers, uh, though that's now kind of, again, under some uh, uh, some process and NCLT issues. But by and large, the trend has been to kind of, you know, uh, in the last two years or so, to kind of hive off the towers. So we will see, uh, I mean, to summarize, we will see, you know, uh, not too many, maybe three, uh, maybe four at best, you know, tower entities, uh, either independent or you know, operator owned, operator led, which is uh, what the picture will emerge, which is uh, similar to what the picture is uh, in in the you know global or Asian scenario. In, in terms of, I must I say one thing. You know, globally, uh, only 15, 15 percent of towers, telecom towers, are held by independent tower companies. The rest, 80 odd percentage are are held still by operator backed or joint ventures of the operators. To that extent, we should see. A similar picture emerging here, not more than three or four significant tower companies. So that that should be fine. You know, you you mentioned when Indus Towers was set up ten years ago. I remember having this conversation with you ten years ago when this was seen as a as a fairly sort of uh, you know revolutionary milestone for the telecom industry. Uh, do you think it has actually played out the way it was envisaged? Uh, and are telecom companies happier getting rid of this out of their books and and sitting separately uh, because you know the core business itself is going through another phase of consolidation? Yeah, and that's what I was saying, and and, and glad you reminded me of a uh, conversation a decade back. Uh, you know, makes me feel quite old, though, uh, on a lighter side. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it's by and large played. See, the industry dynamics has also changed, and tower industry is largely, though several of the tower companies have in the past or even now tried out, you know, related associated ventures, not solely depending on telecom, you know, antenna and equipment there, but other things on the energy side and other initiatives. But by and large, uh, I think it, it's fulfilled, the, in my opinion, I, I mean, I think, again, the telecom operator, you know, senior management uh, may be able to give their perspective. I think, by and large, the perspective of hiving off, even by Vodafone Idea and, and Bharti, Airtel a decade back uh, to an independent, uh, of course, operator-backed entity, that's the trend which has been coming, that let's get the tower business a separate business, which serves me as well as others, and then, then even if I have a... 40% share of or whatever, I'm still you know, better off uh, from a financial perspective and also from an operational uh, synergy perspective. I think it's fine. I mean, the, t the game has changed. I mean, you, you know as much as I know. One point of time, the number of tower growth was anticipated to be huge. 2008, 10, several new operators came in. Then it was a game of you know tenancy enhancement. One tower, can we make it three, four operators? Mm -hmm. Now we have seen exits in telecom sector mergers. Now the game is more on other areas in terms of loading and, and so on and so forth. And then we'll see some growth with the 5G coming and, and so on. So we'll see tower growth, and but not what we saw you know, those days, 10 years back. Good talking to you, Jadeep. We'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Jadeep, for joining us with your views. Jadeep goes from KPMG talking about the uh, Indus Bharti Infratel deal and its impact on the overall telecom sector. All right, that's Telecom. Let's uh, move into earnings now. Wipro will be the third IT major uh, after TCS and Infosys to report its fourth quarter numbers today. All eyes uh, will be on what the management guides for 2019. Agam Akhil is uh, joining us with a sense of what the market expects. Agam.
Oh, so we, we are, yes, we are expecting a, a, well, a debit quarter when it comes to Wipro. Starting off with IT services revenues, uh, we are expecting an uptick of around 2.5%. Expansion in margins at a little over 16%, and well, profits expected to see a growth around 10% quarter on quarter, but this is largely on account of a provision that the company has made in the third quarter of around 317 crores on account of one of its clients uh, going into insolvency proceedings, and that's the reason why we we are looking at an inflated numbers when it comes to its profitability. But moving in, uh, when you consider the guidance, we're expecting a subdued one. In fact, we could, we're likely to see a minus 0.522% in terms of guidance for the first quarter. And this is largely on account of the fact that uh, this is a seasonally weak quarter for Wipro specifically. But moving in, uh, we're also keeping an eye on uh, several uh, factors in terms of uh, banking and financial services as well as uh, an update in the energy vertical, especially after the, we've seen a little bit of an uptick in uh, commodity prices. And of course, we're also going to, going to be keeping an eye on what the company has in mind for plans in the digital services area. Uh, don't forget, we are also uh, focusing on what the company is doing to bring about changes in the IMS as well as the BPO vertical. So these are some of the factors we're watching out for. But on the whole, we're expecting a tepid quarter for uh, Wipro. Adam, thank you for that. Uh, cement major Ultratech will come out of this numbers as well today. High input costs are likely to weigh in on the company's profitability this quarter. Nikki standing by with what the street is anticipating. We're not expecting great set of numbers from Altatech, Harsha. If you look at the top line growth, although that's expected to be driven by the volume performance, looking at a 29.5% year-on-year growth on the top line basis to a number around 8,500-odd crore. EBITDA is also seen up uh, by 14.5% in this quarter uh, for, to a number of around 1,467-odd crore. But then the margins are expected to shrink uh, for this company to 17.2% as compared to nearly 19.4% that we've seen in the corresponding quarter mainly on account of higher power and fuel expenses. Profitability is also expected to drop in this quarter by as much as 22% to a number of 537 crore. This is mainly impacted by the kind of higher finance cost along with the depreciation that the company has taken over after acquiring JP assets. In terms of other key parameters that we we'll keep an eye out uh, will be, uh, A, to begin with, will be your volume growth, a key driver to your EBITDA figure. Uh, that's almost seen up 24% year-on-year basis to a, to a number of around 17 0.5 million ton EBITDA per ton on the other hand is expected to shrink by as much as 8% to a number of around 839 and realization is seen almost flattish here on your basis due to flashes uh, due to flattish prices of cement but one another important factor to watch out in this numbers will be the capacity utilization level of the company uh, after acquiring JPSS which is expected to be around a 65% kind of a number that's that in terms of the period. All right, Nikki, thanks uh, so much for that. Uh, India's newly minted bankruptcy process is in full swing, uh, but the courtrooms handling these bankruptcy cases are lacking a key component, judges. Bloomberg News' Opamanya Trevedi joins us uh, with some of the numbers here. Uh, this is a perennial problem, but it is uh, very much uh, something that could put the bankruptcy process at risk. Opamanya? <laughs> Yeah, uh, yes, Ira, it can definitely put bankruptcy process in risk. Uh, as the latest numbers show, as of January 31st, around 9,000 cases were pending in only national company law tribunals, and there are just 26 judges, that includes judicial members and technical experts, to deal with this huge amount of cases. And with RBI's new gu guidelines that came in February, these numbers are expected to uh, increase, increase by multifold. Uh, and with the shortage of judge, judges, lawyers see uh, this putting a spanner in the works for IBC, which is India's key to deal with $210 billion of uh, stressed assets. And now lawyers are complaining that these cases, these courts don't have uh, time to hear IBC cases, not just IBC cases, but even merger and acquisition cases and Companies Act cases, which is also under the jurisdiction of companies, uh, law tribunal. And they do not see respite to uh, the situation going ahead. But our sources in the government do tell us that government is aware of this problem and is in process of appointing new judges. They 
are also setting up three uh, new NCLT benches at Kochi, Jaipur, uh, and Katak. But uh, lawyers don't see that as much of a way ahead because the number of judges that is required as per research is way high. As many as 80 judges, more, more judges would be required in the coming years. Upani, thank you so much for joining us with those details. That's Upani Trivedi talking about the paucity in judges. Up next, we're talking about the money markets. The U.S. yields hit 3%. The rupee back home is trading at a 13-month low. All those stories on the other side. Sorry, I'm late. क्या हुआ कुछ नहीं यार जस्ट वर्किंग ऑन माय एक्सपेंशन प्लान फंडिंग का चक्कर इट इज सो फ्रस्ट्रेटिंग आई फील लाइक बैंगिंग माय हेड अगेंस्ट द वॉल नो नो डोंट बैंग योर हेड क्रॉस द ब्रिज इंस्टेड ब्रिज हाँ ये देख ला अरे दिस ब्रिज गेट्स यू इन टच विद इंटरेस्टेड इन्वेस्टर्स फंडिंग हैपन्स व्हिच मींस मोर आउटलेट्स मोर कस्टमर्स इंटरेस्टिंग एंड what exactly is this bridge a stock exchange created for your kind of company just list on it and help your business expand really yeah to phir list kar lu aur kya shubh kaam mein der kis baat ki chal ha nsc march saath hamara safalta aapki the sme growth platform from india's largest stock exchange This is a show which gets you a complete wrap of all the stocks that are buzzing in trade. Everyone's a price taker, not a price maker out there. There are better opportunities in the marketplace. The return ratios will improve, margins will improve. What are you seeing? Valuations are extremely expensive. It would take 100 years of profits to really pay off the entire debt. Not all good businesses are good investments. Good return on equity could be expected, and I think that will sustain. The numbers, etc., were pretty sluggish. How much longer they can sustain, I'm not too sure. It has never been the scenario in any of the stocks. It's an avoid for him at this point of time. I wouldn't write it off in such a hurry. We are getting into more complex chemistry. Join me as I navigate the hottest stocks and help you pick the right stock at the right time. Welcome back. You're watching Power Lunch. Let's take a look at the headlines. <laughs> the Nifty is locked in a narrow 30-point range ahead of expiry tomorrow. Mid-caps perform marginally better than the headline indices. The rupee hits a 13-month low. Kotak Mahindra Bank says Indian currency could fall to a record if global and local risks play out. Bharti Infratel will merge with Indus Towers, creating the largest telecom tower operator outside of China. Fortis gets three new offers ahead of the advisory panel's evaluation of bids. IHH and Radian put in binding bids. Manipal also sweetens its offer. All right, all those stories coming up. But first, uh, dip back into the markets flat on the Sensex and the Nifty, perhaps better than what the Asian and the U.S. markets overnight did. Agam is here with the movers this afternoon. Agam. Sure, it's turning out to be a very, very quiet day of trade, especially considering we are looking at uh, expiry tomorrow. Uh, and in general, if, even if you consider the turnovers and the cash markets largely average in the, the futures and options market as well, uh, the turnover standing at a little over 5 lakh crores, that's below at the average of what we've seen in the previous few expiries. That said, among the few sectors that remain in focus in today's job trade, first one, of course, will be the information technology sector. We've seen substantial gains coming in, essentially on the back of TCS, which has seen a little bit of a reversal. We've seen gains coming in HCL technologies as well. And on the, uh, the other sector that's also in focus is the realty sector. And that's where we have substantial gains in brigade enterprises, as well as, uh, well, uh, Delta, uh, rather, 
uh, DB Realty. So on the back of that, we're looking at some gains there. Other than that, weakness all around. And even with respect to, uh, well, your, the, your broader markets, we aren't really looking at too much change in there. And as far as the broad uh, benchmarks are concerned, well, flattened consolidation continues. Thank you for that. But let's focus and talk about the yield on the U.S. 10-year bond. That's traded about 3% overnight trade on Tuesday. What's the significance of this level, if there is, there are any? And what are the implications of uh, higher rates in the United States on broader markets? Bloomberg News spoke to several economists to understand just that. I don't think 3% is a magic number. We, you know, exceeded 3% back in 2013, I think. And then a couple years later, we're down at 1.36. So um, I think, you know, if it, we were to see the yield get above 3.25, then maybe it could break out. But anything up until then, I'm not too worried about. Not much anxiety. Certainly, it is an important number. Uh, it certainly is a, a psychologically important number as well. It's been 2014 since we've seen that number. So generally, higher yields are positive for equities across the board, up into a level. Yeah, up, and, up into a level. Up to a point. <laughs> uh, we think that level is about three and a half percent on the U.S. 10-year. So if we work with the premise that we're in this band where um, bonds uh, yields can rise, but also equities can do well, um, then it's particularly positive for European equities. If you, if you think about equity market risk premium and valuation models, then obviously the real yield is what is the driving force. This is why I've said earlier. I think there's a more psychological um, component to the fixation around the three-year nominal in, in the 10-year. Okay, that's a view of where the 3% or the yield is headed. Uh, but there are a few bulls in the market who still believe that this is the time to stay invested or even get back into bonds. Uh, Bloomberg News' Chris Ansi now joins us on to tell us who is bullish and why. So, Harsha, one interesting view uh, that kind of runs counter to uh, all the kind of hoopla about uh, 3%, the end of the, the bond bull market, uh, is, uh, you know, uh, that there is a template out there uh, that tells us that uh, yields are really not going to be in a long-term upswing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this, uh, this one investor from Prime... Uh, Pine Bridge uh, is essentially, uh, you know, pointing to the Japan example here. Uh, mm -hmm. You look at uh, how Japan uh, for decades has had this aging population, uh, the shrinking workforce coming down, uh, and that essentially leaves companies without much pricing power. There's, you know, there's fewer consumers uh, to buy stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, I'm based in Japan. You, know, you go around and you just see, uh, even with tourists coming in uh, to Japan, there's just fewer people to buy things. So the pricing power goes down, so the inflation just isn't going to pick up uh, in um, the other countries where the same uh, template lies uh, in front of us. You look at uh, the demographics of Europe, the United States, and even in some of the emerging markets, Thailand, for, for example, you know, you, you see this kind of curve uh, of the workforce coming down. Uh, and Pinebridge is saying that, uh, you know, inflation, uh, yeah, maybe it'll tick up a little bit the next few months, but we're not in a breakout period here. Uh, and so, uh, you know, when the uh, yields pick up, it's time to go back in. Uh, and Pinebridge is saying, you know, maybe not treasuries, but uh, you look at somewhere where you get a little bit of a premium. Uh, this guy, Seaman, uh, likes uh, uh, Qatar bonds, uh, Abu Dhabi petroleum, uh, where you get about 5%. And he says, you know, in an era when uh, you're not going to have a breakout in inflation, 5% is pretty good. Yields moving about 3% while uh, U.S. equities are, are, are seeming to come off. Uh, broadly the same scenario that we are here in India as well. How is the market reading all of this? So, uh, I, you know, Pinebridge aside, there's no question that, uh, you know, there are a number of traders who haven't seen this 3%, uh, you know, barrier hit for a while. And uh, there have been plenty of uh, veterans out there, like the PIMCO guys, Gunlatch, saying that, yeah, you know, the bond, uh, you know, uh, bull market is done. Mm. Higher yields uh, mean you've got a higher discount rate for all those future uh, earnings from companies. So you got to sell stocks, too. Mm. Uh, so there's no doubt that we're seeing, uh, you know, the reverberation of this. You saw Indonesia intervening in the foreign exchange market to protect the rupiah, for example. So we are seeing repercussions uh, all over uh, markets, and it's probably going to be uh, you know, a bit of a shakeout for a while. 
Christancy, thanks so much. And uh, talking about shakeout, we're certainly seeing a shakeout in the Indian currency markets as well. Uh, the higher yields, the consequently stronger dollar, is adding to the troubles of the Indian currency, which is trading at a 13-month low. Uh, it's also led a number of forecasters, belatedly, might, I might add, uh, to cut their forecast for the Indian rupee for the year. Uh, Shubhadeep Sirkar of Bloomberg News is here with us. Uh, Shubhadeep, uh, we started the year, well, not even four months back, with everyone being bullish on the Indian currency, saying we're going to have another year of appreciation. That seems to be turning. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we over yesterday, since yesterday, we have had a spate of uh, foreign banks and brokerages which have cut their focus on the rupee. I, I might add a bit belatedly, given <laughs> what the rupee's fortunes have been of late. But clearly, the game changer, as one of the one of the brokerages, Maybank, pointed out, is is oil oil prices. Now, oil prices now going above 70, sustaining above 70, poses a major major threat to uh, the Indian rupee. From 18 percent two years back in value terms, uh, the share of uh, oil in imports currently standing at around 27 percent. So that's that's quite a big move in two years' time. So basically, if oil is, remains on the boil, uh, I think the rupee is, is the only one-way traffic for the rupee. There's also the fund flow uh, problem, and I'll just throw that number up on uh, the screen for you. It's always, you know, it's a classic chicken and egg. What comes first, the fund flows or the weaker rupee? Uh, but uh, April uh, has been a bad month. 11,000 crore in outflows, both equity and debt added up. Uh, and that is, I think, the worst since about December 2016, uh, if I have that number right. Yes, December uh, 2016 was the last time uh, we saw these kind of outflows or outflows higher than that amount. So that's adding to it. Shubhadeep, thanks so much uh, for joining us. Uh, that's the currency picture. Uh, Shubhadeep mentioned oil. Uh, oil is a complication for the Indian currency. It is a bigger complication uh, for the Indian economy. Uh, let me just uh, throw up a couple of graphics on what the higher oil prices are going to mean uh, for India, various aspects of the Indian economy. Uh, the trade-off currently, the big trade-off is between government finances and inflation. Uh, remember, the government over uh, the last 15-odd uh, months had increased excise duties quite considerably. It did one cut in October 2017, but still, excise duties have been piled on to petroleum products uh, because the government is earning good revenue out of it. Now, uh, as prices rise and the burden on consumers rise, if the government were to choose to cut excise duties by 2 rupees per litre, that would mean a 28,000 crore revenue hit uh, for the government. There's a revenue hit, there's also a subsidy hit because in the budget this year, uh, the government seemed to have under-provided a little bit for oil subsidies uh, at about 25,000 crore, which was at par with the last financial year. Uh, Kotak uh, economic research estimates that at $65 per barrel, uh, the subsidy will be, be, will be about 5,000 crore higher. At $75 a barrel, the subsidy bill will be about 10,000 crore higher. So that is uh, the government math. Now, the reason to go ahead and cut excise duties uh, would be to try and protect uh, the economy from uh, a resurgence of inflation in a big way. Uh, the math on the inflation front is this, uh, that at present, the RBI expects inflation to range between 5.1 to 4.4 percent, with 5.1 uh, likely in the first half of the year. Uh, well, that is estimated based on a oil price of about $68 per barrel, average oil price of $68 per barrel. If the price is $10 per barrel higher than that, then that adds about 30 basis points to the inflation forecast and could mean that the Monetary Policy Committee uh, would lean more quickly towards tighter monetary policy and higher interest rates. There is also a growth impact, uh, and the growth impact, as assessed by the Reserve Bank of India, suggests that if prices are higher by $10 a barrel, then the growth uh, forecast would need to be cut down uh, by about 10, 10 basis points. So those are some of the issues uh, that the economy is grappling with. Of course, I haven't even mentioned the current account because there, there's no trade-off. Uh, as prices rise, your oil import bill uh, goes up by 0.3% of GDP for every uh, $10 per barrel increase in the oil prices. And that, of course, uh, puts uh, pressure on the currency, which we were talking about earlier. All we can do is hope that it doesn't cross 68 and fingers crossed for the broader economy. Uh, emerging markets, meanwhile, seem, still seem to be a great investment destination. That certainly is a view of Sheila Patel of Goldman Sachs. Uh, speaking to Bloomberg's uh, Rishad Salamat earlier today, she says that investors should actively invest in emerging markets. Here, here's why.
For us, what's been clear is EM, both equities and debt, have been a great place to be and continue to be of strong interest to us based on the macroeconomic fundamentals in EM, based on how EM has actually performed both in periods of volatility. Look but at it's changed, as we said. It's, it's, you can't apply the previous you rules can. to the current rules, can That's you? true. Yeah. That's true. But actually, if you, if you apply some of the previous experiences and then you look at today's conditions, it actually feels like a more healthy environment than ever to be actively investing, not just passive because of the difference between the uh, few hundred stocks in a passive sense and the thousands of stocks Absolutely. in an emerging Last economy. Last year was passive. This year, you've got to be active. This year, you have yeah. to be active, particularly in EM. But, but I think that um, those changes, exactly what you're identifying, is why we find EM, both debt and equities, a really interesting place to be from a global perspective. Sheila, I'd just like to wrap things up with the dollar how is that informing your investment decisions and where does it go next? Have mm -hmm. we turned around for it or what? Mm -hmm. Look, I think that the uh, dollar is a real challenge for many of our clients from an international perspective because it's been hard to predict and their expectation is in a rising rate environment, uh, they're not going to get any relief, right? So I think um, if you look at what the U.S. has said, certainly from an exports perspective and a general perspective, they seem quite happy with the way things are going. But from a global markets perspective, it's hard to believe we can continue on this trend for an extended period without some reaction. That's a view from uh, Goldman Sachs. Jaguar, meanwhile, Jaguar Land Rover is set to trim 1,000 jobs in UK owing to Brexit and diesel-related issues. Ralph Speth, however, says this is a temporary problem. Speaking again to Rishad on the sidelines of the Beijing Auto Show, uh, Speth says that China continues to remain a key market for the company. At the moment, it's a very temporary situation for Czech Land Rover. It's Brexit, but it's also diesel. It's diesel gate in Europe, but also very special taxes in the UK, and we can deal with it. It's nothing to do with the further expansion plans of Czech Land Rover around the world. Uh, absolutely. So, do you foresee deeper cuts to jobs and perhaps production cuts as well, or can you actually perhaps get around that by producing elsewhere? We are going to expand our global footprint. Why? Because we have to. We have to be closer to the customers and we have to also export so that at the end of the day we can be more powerful also in the UK. As you know, we have all our research, all our design, all our engineering in the UK and we are a proudly British company and we want to stay there and we want to expand. And that's the reason, by the way, why we are investing more than 1.3 billion right in this moment in the UK for further engineering labs, for the expansion of the engineering team. So we are really prepared and preparing the company for the next level. So let's talk about China a little bit. It's a hugely important market for you. Where does it evolve? How does it evolve looking ahead? We are very successful. We came in very late to China, but we have accelerated and have sixfold increased our sales in China over the last four years. So we are the fastest growing brand in China. And that's very good, sir, because China is the biggest market on earth, more than 24 million sales a year. And we ex expect that China will grow further. And today, today we unveiled the Range Rover SV Coupé, which you see behind me, but also the I-Pace, the new premium and the first premium high-tech battery electric vehicle. And you did a deal with uh, Waymo on self-driving cars. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, you know, since this environment has changed, since uh, that Uber crash that we had as well, um, autonomous cars are possibly in the future, but tell us about the deal with Waymo, though, in a little bit more detail. At the very moment, nobody really can offer autonomous drive. We have a lot of driver assistance in the cars already, but not a really autonomous drive. This kind of technology needs not only one OEM. This needs government, academia, and uh, collaboration across sectors of the industry. Nobody can do it on its own. And we have therefore teamed up with the very best, with Waymo, the former Google uh, project, which means we have teamed up with the very best.
Well, with that in mind, where are you with the development of an autonomous vehicle? Have you done any testing yet? Uh, I know it's early doors with Waymo, but how do you actually do these autonomous tests? Are you doing them in China, the UK, or where, if at all? We are testing all around the world, but quite uh, clearly, predominantly in the UK, where we have an opportunity to do so. And you know that means we also have to sharpen our IT. This means million lines of codes have to be developed and written to make the vehicle safer for the future. Overall, this kind of technology should make the roads safer. 90% of all accidents happening uh, uh, on streets nowadays are from the drivers. And we have 1.25 million deaths globally every year on the streets. And if we can reduce that, we can really deliver an active contribution to make our uh, journeys safer. India has pledged more than $500 million to develop Iran's Shabar port uh, since 2003, but repeated delays have prompted Iran to now turn to China. So could a remote port in Iran be the next trigger for geopolitical tensions between China and India? Hear it. A remote port in Iran could further escalate geopolitical tensions between India and China. Since 2003, India has pledged more than $500 million to develop Iran's Chabahar port. But delays in construction have made Iran restless. It now wants to bring India's neighbors and rivals, China and Pakistan, on board. And that could be bad news for India. From India's perspective, the Jabahar port will open up a new strategic route connecting Iran, India and Afghanistan, bypassing Pakistan. The idea was that if uh, the access to Afghanistan is solely being controlled by Pakistan, then certainly new ways, new mechanisms, new transport corridors, new roads and, uh, and new ports will have to be built. So the India and Iran uh, had since then started exploring this possibility of what can be done via Chabahar. And that was something that Afghanistan was also very keen because Afghanistan otherwise uh, is a very landlocked country. And while it's a way to help Afghanistan, it will also give India access to the vital markets of Central Asia. That's the economic advantage. But the port is also of strategic importance. India sees Chabahar as a counter to the Gwadar port in Pakistan that's being funded by China. But if Iran gets China on board, India may stand to lose. The facilities that, uh, that China is creating around India cause a lot of concern about the possibility of what China eventually can do. But I think uh, the concern will always be there that China is now has strategic outposts in India's vicinity which India will find very difficult to counter. A shift makes sense for Iran, which wants to ensure Chabahar is an economic success. But China's possible interests there could weaken India's strategic advantages and trade interests. China certainly economic value attached to the project and I, in my sense is that uh, that's something that uh, Iranians would be very keen to uh, have. And at some point Indians also would want to have a port uh, that is uh, viable economically where uh, freedom, uh, freedom of trade exists. Where, but I think the question that India would be asking and Indi India would be entitled to ask Iran is how far Iran would go uh, in terms of balancing China vis-a-vis -vis India and whether Indian interests would be preserved. So far, uh, they, they, Iran is uh, given very ambiguous signal. But if uh, they decide to certainly uh, enhance China and Pakistan's profile, then I think uh, India will have to reconsider its own involvement. Out of time on the show. Thank you so much for joining us today. Countdown is up next.